afternoon and welcome to uh, another one of our security seminars. It is uh, a distinct pleasure for me today to introduce our guest. Uh, there aren't many people who've been working in security uh, from an academic standpoint uh, longer than I have. Uh, but uh, uh, Virgil was definitely there early on, one of the pioneers in the field. Um, Virgil is a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Maryland, uh, where he has been involved in a number of projects over the years. He's the most uh, recent winner of the National Computer Systems uh, Security Award, a uh, very distinct honor, uh, one of the highest honors in the field, and is also currently the chair of the ACM Special Interest uh, group on Securities Audit and Control, uh, and we're very pleased to be able to welcome Professor Virgil Gleekor, so please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Thank Scott. You Thank you for having me. So I'm pleased to be here. This is my third trip to Purdue University. Uh, the last one was in 2001, and the first one in 1977 at the Operating System Symposium, which was held here. So. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is about adversary models <coughs> and how they evolved over time and what we can learn from this evolution. Uh, and this work is based on some joint work done with uh, Howen Chen, Brian Pardino, and their advisor, Adrian Perig. Okay, so here is the overview. Uh, the, the three punchlines, if you want, that I will have are the following. First, the resolution. Security is a fundamental concern of secondary importance, and this sounds paradoxical, but I'll try to justify it, try to justify why is it that I claim it's not just a fundamental concern, but it's a concern of secondary importance. And the second point is that new technologies, um, no matter what they are, they offer to us an insurmountable opportunity to deny both characteristics of the resolution. In other words, change the security from a fundamental concern into a technological concern, uh, and from a secondary importance concern to a primary importance concern. And the third point is uh, that uh, what uh, I've been learned, I, I've learned at least so far, is that perfect is the enemy of the good, and we cannot perf have perfect security, at least in face of very strong adversaries, such as of the kind that I'm going to talk about today, Therefore, we have to uh, learn to put up with good enough. And I'll show you what I believe good enough is. Good enough is always um, accompanied in this business by risk analysis, of which we did very little so far, at least in the academia. Okay, so uh, why is security a fundamental concern? <clears throat> so I argue that security is a fundamental concern for two reasons. One is that any new technology that we introduced in computing, and in fact, it doesn't matter what field we introduced a new technology in, um, we introduce along with the good, the bad, namely uh, new vulnerabilities. And this you can trace back to the Industrial Revolution. Any, any invention which humankind produced, at least since then, um, had not only solved some practical problem and offered new functionality, but it also caused uh, uh, various avenues of attacking whatever systems the technology was used in. Occasionally, these new vulnerabilities which are introduced require the definition of a new adversary. In other words, uh, they are so, these vulnerabilities could be exploited in such powerful ways that the old adversary definitions that we have no longer um, satisfy reality. And of course, um, once we define the adversary, we can build uh, new tools and, of course, backed up by new methods to handle uh, that adversary. It's not clear to me that adversary definitions come before new tool definitions or new tool definitions come before the adversary, but nevertheless, uh, they, they come in, in some order, and I will not discuss too, too, too much the order in which they appear. So I'll give you some examples of this phenomenon. Uh, they illustrate the first uh, reason why security is fundamental. The second reason why security is fundamental um, is <coughs> that security is a technology-independent concern, namely that if the cost of technology goes to zero, security still remains a fundamental concern. So for those two reasons, I claim it's fundamental. First, any new technology introduces vulnerabilities, 
possibly new adversaries, possibly a new security problem that we haven't seen before. And second, that no matter what happens to the cost of technology, we still have uh, this, this problem to solve, namely security problem to solve. So let me review what happened over time. Um, I'll just take a few examples of what happened uh, to our uh, introduction of new technologies and the definitions of adversaries and vulnerabilities. So the first thing that at least I choose to point to in terms of new technologies appeared in early to mid-60s when people built systems like CTSS at MIT and then Multics at MIT, when in fact uh, with Multics sharing user mode programs and data uh, became a goal uh, of the system design. And in order to enable the sharing of user mode programs and data uh, and to define what was used to be called the computing utility, uh, people decided that they had to solve at least three uh, vulnerabilities that would be introduced by this sharing uh, at the user level, not at the system level. We are not talking about sharing compilers or assemblers or, uh, or assemblers or any other utilities. So first was confidentiality and integrity, and then parallel to that was system penetration. The idea was that if you share user level programs and data, um, users could actually access data generated by other users, um, and in fact, uh, breach the confidentiality of those data. Or um, users could actually, if we don't build the appropriate protection mechanism, could actually corrupt uh, other application data uh, which other users might use. And there are all sorts of instances which, which came up, even very sophisticated ones. Like, for example, we had the notion of memoryless subsystems in which you had the user level subsystem, which would be a circuit analysis program used by two competing companies, let's say Intel and Fairchild. And they would use possibly, uh, hypothetically, this user level subsystem built at Berkeley for circuit analysis. And this circuit analysis program, which was an application level program, could actually retain some of the parameters produced by one company and leak them to the other company, breaching confidentiality. In other words, between two instances of invocation by two competing companies, this subsystem maintained memory. So this is one of the this weird cases of, of confidentiality breaches that people dreamed up at the time. Um, in order to support these mechanisms that would enable confidentiality and integrity breaches to be prevented, uh, we had to make sure that the system itself was uh, penetration free. In other words, that some adversary could not circumvent the protection mechanism by actually circumventing the, uh, the penetration freedom of the system, by breaching into the system. So we had penetration resistant concerns. These were vulnerabilities that, that we were worried about. In fact, uh, if you think about 1968, 67, 68, people started looking at um, parameter checking at the interfaces, uh, including buffer overflow, by the way. Uh, parameter checking like address checking, privilege checking, address space checking, and so on. And these were all time of check, time of use. These were all part of the system penetration resistance properties that we were concerned with. Not me, but we as a community. Uh, so who was the adversary at the time? The adversary was an untrusted user mode program, typically operating on behalf of, uh, of a, a terminal user, uh, the user sitting in front of a terminal. And um, in fact, that user mode program could carry out, and it did carry out, the, the, the wishes of the uh, human user at the terminal. Now, what kind of methods and tools came to handle this problem? So first of all, we separated the system mode from the user mode and made sure that only privileged users entered system mode. And we invented things like rings and security kernels. And this came about 1965 through about 1972. We also invented uh, the flow hypothesis methodology, which was basically glorified hacking about 1975.